Southampton docks at dawn. A great ship looms out of the grey autumn mist. She's a whaling ship at the start of a voyage to the other end of the world, to the Antarctic Ocean. But this ship would be a strange sight to the men who manned the whaling ships in bygone days. She's a floating factory, equipped with up-to-date machinery and a crew of 400 men, many of whom are not sailors but factory workers. During the months at sea, these men will be busy extracting from the whales the oil and food that make them so valuable. Every year, many countries send out fleets to the whaling grounds. Let's travel with one of these expeditions, leaving England early one October morning. The factory ship travels the first lap of the journey alone, 6,000 miles from Southampton to Cape Town. There, the catcher ships, which do the actual hunting of the whales, are waiting to join her. The expedition, now complete, sets its course southward for the remaining 2,000 miles to the Antarctic. As we've seen, each expedition includes a factory ship and several catcher vessels. These ships are small and speedy, built to maneuver as swiftly and suddenly as the whales they hunt. Following a long tradition, the crews come mostly from Norway. Most highly skilled of all are the harpoon gunners, whose trade is often handed down from father to son. Men have hunted the whale for over a thousand years and more. The old fishing grounds of the northern hemisphere are now exhausted, and only here, in the icy seas of the Antarctic, is the whale still plentiful. Here he feeds on plankton, millions of tiny plant and animal organisms which flourish in the polar seas. So here the whaling fleets must follow, ploughing on day after day through seas in which the floating ice grows thicker and tighter, piling up into great masses which bar the way to the south. The expedition now approaches the continent of Antarctica, five million square miles of icy waste, attracting only the explorer, the scientist, and the whaler. As the sturdy little ships force their bows through the ice towards the open water which lies beyond, the men aboard grow ever more eager, more impatient. The whaling grounds are confined to the regions between the South Shetland Islands and the entrance to the Ross Sea. At last, open water. Now there's no time to be lost. The catchers have to be refueled after their long journey. Men who travelled out with the factory ship transfer to their own ships. All harpoons and equipment must be checked, ready for the first trip. The catchers cruise at a range of about 50 miles. From the 1st of December until the beginning of April, they'll sail and search, hoping that luck will be with them. As the catchers set out, the sea is calm, the weather fine, everything seems set fair for a good season. The modern whale hunters have a new recruit to their fleet, the aeroplane. This is carried aboard the factory ship. The aircraft is launched from the deck by a catapult and is used for reporting weather and ice conditions ahead of the expedition. But this time, a catcher needs its help for whale spotting. On board the catcher, the lookout climbs to the crow's nest high above the deck. The gunner holds a conference on the bridge. The deckhands see that their gear runs smoothly. Ahead, the ocean seems empty, undisturbed. Suddenly, a whale breaks surface. There it is again. There she blows. A yell from the lookout directs the waiting gunner on the bridge. With his eyes on the blowing whale, he hurries along the narrow catwalk. The chase is on. The little ship can do 16 knots, but so can a blue whale on the run with his life at stake. 
He turns and plunges beneath the waves, seeking blindly for a way of escape. The hunt is keen. Aircraft and catcher close in, tracking down their quarry. The distance is narrowing. The whale's pace is slowing, and the catcher ship gains on him. The gunner stands poised, sighting along his gun, ready to strike. At 60 yards, he's within firing range. He fires, and within two seconds, the explosive charge in the head of the harpoon goes off. There's a brief struggle as the whale fights for his life, taking the harpoon rope to its full extent. Slowly, his strength ebbs. The rope takes the strain and is hauled closer to the catcher. To hasten the end, a second harpoon is fired. More humane methods of killing are now being tried out so that the death of the mightiest animal on land or in the sea may be as quick and painless as possible. The dead whale is brought alongside watched by men who have made the first catch of the season. Compressed air is pumped into the body to keep it afloat. A flag is stuck into the whale to show which catcher has made the kill. Then it's cut adrift to be picked up later, either by special towing vessels or by the returning catcher. After about a day and a half hunting, the catchers bring their haul back to the factory ship. The crews prepare the whales for delivery. Whalers are not allowed to kill as many whales as they please. The number and length of whales which may be taken is regulated by international agreement in order to preserve whales for future years. The whales are taken on board the factory ship by means of a hole in her stern. This leads to a slipway up which the whales are pulled onto the deck. A blue whale has been known to measure over 100 feet in length and to weigh as much as 40 large elephants. Whales are still something of a mystery. They're mammals, for they suckle their young and have the same lungs for breathing and the same blood as land animals. Yet they live, eat and breed in the sea as easily as fish. A government inspector measures each whale as it's brought aboard. It's also his job to see that there's no waste in the cutting up of the whales. The first task is to flense the whale. This means parting the blubber and skin from the carcass with special flensing knives so that it can be hauled off in large strips. Next, the carcass is dragged to another deck where it will be cut up. Often the decks are made dangerously slippery by oil and blood. Only the waste matter will be thrown overboard. The jawbone and spine are cut into handy lengths by steam saws. These pieces of bone are fed through hatches into the factory below deck. Consider what's extracted from the whale and you can understand why a season's catch may be valued at over two million pounds. The blubber is rendered down for oil used in the manufacture of margarine and soap. The liver provides oil and extract for medicinal use. The bone is crushed for fertilizers. The meat provides animal food and extracts for soups and gravies, while selected pieces for human consumption are stored in refrigerators. A beginning has been made with the canning of fresh whale meat at sea. Twice during the season, oil tankers come down from Europe. They bring news of home, letters for the crews and fuel for the ships. With a dead whale acting as fender, the tanker ties up alongside the factory ship.
Once the fuel is transferred to the factory ship, the tanks are cleaned and purified and whale oil is taken on. Sacks of bone and meat meal will also travel home in the tanker's available storage space. To the lonely whaling men, these ships bring a welcome contact with home. When the tankers sail northward again, the whaling ships are isolated once more. Many more weeks in the Antarctic lie ahead before they too can sail the 8,000 mile journey back to England. The short Antarctic summer will soon be over. The weather will get worse and the winter months will bring blizzards, squall and heavy seas. While spring comes to Europe, the temperature in Antarctica drops several degrees further below freezing point as each day goes by. In these conditions, the gunner's task will be more difficult. Whales will be harder to find, even harder to shoot. But while the season lasts and the catch allowed has not been reached, the men and ships of this modern whaling fleet search on so that the harvest of the whaling grounds may be brought home in full measure.